to Vinesha Paris, our next speaker, and she will talk about uh, possible extension of linear inequality method for generalized rational Chebyshev approximation problems. Please, Vinesha. Thank you, Nadia. Um, hello, everyone. I am Vinesha Paris. I'm a PhD student at Swinburne University of Technology. So this is basically a shorter version of the talk that I gave at Womburn, uh, sorry, uh, Mokao a few weeks ago. So if you want to refill your coffee uh, and grab another coffee, do it, uh, go ahead, that's fine. So today I will be talking about extending the linear inequality method for generalized rational Chebyshev approximation. So this is a joint work with Nadia Sukurukova. So this is my outline for today. So uh, I will be able to demonstrate the uh, correspondence between the linear inequality method and the bisection method developed for generalized uniform rational approximation problem. So I'll start off with uniform approximation. So uh, what we do in uniform approximation, we try to reduce or minimize the maximum deviation of the approximation from the original function. So this is the formulation for a general uniform approximation problem. So we have our original function f of t, which is univariate, and psi of a t is our approximation, and t is the same t as in f of t, and capital A consists of the decision variables that we can change. So basically we are trying to, um, we are looking for the set of decision variables that could give us as best as possible approximation in the uniform sense. So we try to reduce or minimize the worst error in our approximation. So if I um, expand this formulation a little bit for a, a polynomial and for a piecewise polynomial, then we have this formulation. Of course, the decision variables are now the coefficients and GITs are the basis functions. So for polynomials, these basis functions are just monomials. And for piecewise polynomials, these basis functions are uh, constructed based on the so-called truncated power function. And if we, uh, if we approximate the function f of t, using a ratio of two linear functions, then we have generalized uniform rational approximation. So capital A and capital B, they consist of the decision variables coming from the numerator and the denominator. And GT and HT, they consist of basis functions. And these basis functions are not restricted to monomials. So they can be, this GT and HT, they can be any function of T as long as this numerator and the denominator remain linear with respect to capital A and B. So we basically have a ratio of two linear functions. Of course, we want our denominator to be positive and we usually fix one of the uh, terms in the denominator just to make sure that we are not getting uh, multiple optimum solutions which are multipliers of each other. So one very well-known example for this generalized uniform rational approximation is the classical case where we approximate the function using a ratio of two polynomials. So the basis functions are now monomials and the set of decision variables, uh, we have n plus one variables coming from the numerator. And if you fix B naught, then we have M number of decision variables coming from the denominator. So the dimension for this set of decision variables is N plus one plus M. So I will be using this terminology generalized and classical often just to uh, distinguish these two cases. So when I say generalized rational functions, I am actually referring to a ratio of two linear functions. And when I say classical rational functions, I am talking about the ratio of two polynomials. So this is a comparison between the rational and polynomial approximations in uniform norm. So the figure on your left, we have three functions. The blue color function is the original function, which is nonlinear and non legit and it has a sudden change at 0.25. And the black color function is the rational type 4-4, which means we have a ratio of two polynomials and the degree 
uh, of the polynomial in the numerative form and the degree of the polynomial in the denominative form. So the dimension for this uh, problem is nine. We have four plus one parameters coming from the numerator and four parameters coming from the denominator. So altogether it's nine. And the pink color function is the polynomial approximation of degree eight. So we have nine parameters in total. So even though the dimensions are same for these two cases, rational and polynomial, if you look at the graph, you'll see that the rational approximation gives us very um, accurate approximation and it is very, very close to the original function. But the polynomial approximation cannot even catch this abrupt change. And if you move to the figure on your right, we have the maximum deviation graph. So the maximum deviation for the polynomial approximation is almost three times bigger than the maximal deviation for the rational case. So when it comes to approximating a, a nonlinear or a non elliptic function, rational, function, rational approximation gives us superior results over polynomial approximation. So this is a comparison between the classical rational approximation and the generalized rational approximation. So the figure on your left, we have three functions again. The black color function is the original function, which is the same as before. And the blue color function is the classical case. Uh, just as before, we have a ratio of two polynomials of degree four and four. And the pink color function is rational piecewise two two, which means we have a ratio of two piecewise polynomials of degree two and two. So for these two piecewise polynomials, we fix the nodes. Nodes are the uh, uh, places where this function changes from one polynomial to another. So the nodes are fixed and the coefficients are subjected to optimize. So for this generalized case, we have nine parameters in total. So I will talk about this example when I move to numerical experiments. So for now, we have the same dimension for this classical and generalized cases. Since we fix both nodes in the numerator and the denominator at 0 0.25, where this um, original function has this abrupt change, we are getting a superior result. Even if you look at the maximum deviation graph, the maximum deviation for the classical case is slightly less than 0 0.06. And for the generalized case, it is somewhere around 0 0.01. So, when it comes to approximating a nonlinear or a non legit function, and if you're using generalized rational functions, so uh, if you know what basis functions that you should use, and if you're using piecewise polynomials, if you know where to put your nodes, then it is very likely to get better approximations over, uh, over classical rational functions. So we have this linear inequality method, which was developed by Henry Loeb in 1960, one of the oldest method, but it's a very simple method. So what they do, they take the generalized rational approximation problem, and then they take the uh, set to be the variable, uh, which represents the maximum absolute deviation. So we come up with these inequalities. So if we include set into our set of decision variables, then these inequalities become nonlinear. So what they did, they specify upper and lower bounds, which uh, basically an interval, which includes this maximum absolute deviation. So then they fix it at the midpoint of this interval. Then they wanted to check if this system has a feasible solution. So the way to check if there is a feasible solution or not is actually done by solving a linear programming problem. So at each step of this process, they solve a linear programming problem to check the feasibility of this system of inequalities. And according to the feasibility, they update the upper or the lower bounds. So at that time, uh, they did not probably realize that this objective function forms a quasi convex function, but now we know and we use this fact to develop the bisection algorithm. So when we have a ratio of two polynomials, which is classical rational function, the objective function forms a strictly quasi-convex function. It was uh, proved by Ian Barrow in 1973. 
But when we have a generalized rational function, a ratio of two linear functions, this defines a quasi-convex function. So I'm not going to uh, walk you through the proof, but, uh, but I have to mention that a ratio of two linear functions forms a quasi-linear function, which means the function is quasi-convex and quasi-concave at the same time. So this ratio forms a quasi-linear function, and this leads this function to be a quasi-convex function. So what if we have our approximation in the, in the form of a quasi-linear function with respect to its parameters? So instead of having a ratio of two linear functions, now we have a general quasi-linear function, f of a t, and f of a t is quasi-linear with respect to capital A. So if we rewrite this max absolute uh, deviation as the maximum between the original function minus the approximation and approximation minus the original function, we are basically taking the maximum between two quasi-convex functions, which is quasi-convex. And ultimately, we are taking the maximum over a family of quasi-convex function, which is again quasi-convex. So we have this lemma. If the approximation is quasi-linear with respect to its parameters, then the corresponding Chebyshev approximation problem is quasi-convex. So this is basically extending the linear inequality method to a broader class of function. So linear inequality method was developed for generalized rational functions. So we can extend it for, a, um, for, the, for our approximations in the form of uh, a quasi-linear function with respect to its parameters. So moving on to the bisection method defined for quasi-convex optimization. This method relies on solving a convex feasibility problem at the uh, midpoint of each step of this uh, bisection interval. And if this convex problem is feasible, we update the upper bound or else we update the lower bound. So luckily for us, for the classical and for the generalized rational approximation, the convex feasibility problems are not even convex, but linear. So these convex feasibility problems can be reduced to solving a linear programming problem. So before I move on to the bisection algorithm, I will reformulate my problem. So uh, we take the maximum absolute deviation to be this variable set. So we come up with these inequalities. And since the denominator is positive, we can multiply each term by the denominator. So the direction of this inequality will not change. So we can take everything on our right-hand side to the left-hand side. So we end up with this problem one. This is uh, actually an equivalent problem to problem zero, but I would like to emphasize problem one because I will be using problem one quite a few times in the next two slides. So if we include Z into our decision variable Z, <coughs> these inequalities become nonlinear. So what we do, we specify the initial up and lower bounds for the bisection interval. And then we fix Z at the midpoint of this interval. And then we have to check if our problem one has a feasible solution. If there is a feasible solution, we update the upper bound or else we update the lower bound. And we have to continue this process until the gap between these two bounds become really very small. So the next natural question that comes to mind is how do we check the feasibility of problem one? So we check the feasibility of problem one using this convex feasibility problem, which is not easy to formulate in general, but for this particular case, we know how to formulate it and therefore we can solve it. So problem two is our convex feasibility problem, which is actually reduced to a linear programming problem. So we solve this linear programming problem. If u is less than or equal to zero, then problem one is feasible. If u is greater than zero, then problem one is infeasible. And according to the feasibility of problem one, we update the upper or the lower bounds. So this is how basically the bisection method works. So what if we, uh, um, what if we formulate our approximation in the form of a general quasi-linear function? So we have a quasi-linear function here, f of a t, 
and f of a t is quasi linear with respect to capital a and since f of a t is quasi linear the feasible set described by this inequalities is convex so even though you see just two inequalities here we have these type of inequalities for each t in this interval c d so we have to what we have to do we basically have to find a point in the intersection of this convex set so we are extending the bisection method which was uh, developed for uh, a generalized rational function to uh, approximations in the form of general quasi linear function so moving on to the numerical experiment so here we have a free not linear approximation so when i was talking about a ratio of two piecewise polynomials i fix the co fix the knots and optimize the coefficients but for this particular example we are doing it the other way around and this is the only place that we do it the other way around so we fix the coefficients and optimize the knot value so a not a1 and a2 are fixed and we need a2 to be non zero because if a2 is zero we end up with this linear piece and there is nothing to optimize so we need a2 to be non zero and our only uh, decision variable is theta so this is kind of an example uh, where it is not very straightforward to see what uh, uh, linear programming problem that we need to solve so here what we do we take the maximum absolute deviation uh, to be uh, delta so we end up with these two inequalities and then we take a not a1 t and f of t to the other sides and we divide uh, both sides by uh, the um, absolute value of a2 and to simplify things we take gt and z so we come up with these two inequalities so the feasibility problem is actually reduced to fitting this maximum function in the area between gt minus z and gt plus z so this maximum function consists of two linear pieces the first piece is zero and then it goes up and the slope is one so we need to check if there is a theta value that satisfies these two conditions so we have two cases here so in the first case we have more than one solution so this green color function is the uh, upper bound gt plus z and this this green color function is gt minus z which is the lower bound and we have this red color function gt so then what we do we start at zero and we go all the way down until we hit the lower bound and then we go up so for this case we have more than one possibility for theta so theta can be anywhere between a and b and for any theta value between a and b it will gives us a feasible solution but for this case again we start at zero and we go all the way down until we hit the lower bound and then we go up we cannot tilt this part because the slope is fixed we cannot change the slope so we go up but there is no feasible solution so there is no theta value that could give us a feasible solution so uh, this uh, example is actually constructed to uh, demonstrate illustratively that it is not very straightforward to see what a linear programming problem that we need to solve so this is another uh, experiment uh where we use a ratio of two piecewise polynomials but for this case the knots are fixed so this is what i was talking about uh, at the beginning so the knots are fixed and the coefficients are subjected to optimize so we have uh, five coefficients to be determined in the numerator and four coefficients in the denominator so altogether the dimension is nine and we consider two cases here in the first case we fix theta 1 and theta 2 at the same place and in the next case we we fix theta 1 and theta 2 at different places so when the knots are fixed at the same location so we know that the original function has an abrupt change at 0.25 so we fix both knots at 0.25 the approximation is very very close to the original function it is very accurate 
and we have nine alternating points and the maximum absolute deviation is 0 0.01. But if we move these two nodes a little bit to the left or to the right, we don't get nine alternating points. It is always less than nine. And the maximum deviation is even much higher than before. It is 0 0.1. So in the second case, we fix these nodes at different locations. So for the first four cases, uh, the uh, at least one of the nodes is located at 0 0.25, where this correctly identified knot is actually located there. And for the next two cases, neither of these nodes are located at 0 0.25. And for the last two cases, we considered equidistant nodes. So uh, for the first equidistant case, the uh, knot in the numerator is located at minus one over three, and the knot in the denominator is located at one over three. And for the last case, we interchange these two uh, knot values. So the maximum number of uh, alternating points we are getting is nine uh, for this last case. So if you look at the uh, pictures, so uh, for the first equidistant case, we have only seven alternating points, but we have this peak, which is ready to go up. And if we interchange these two nodes, we get nine alternating points, uh, but the maximum deviations are not, um, uh, not very uh, different from each other. So if we blindly move these nodes around, uh, it is not really very clear whether we are getting a better approximation or not. But if we know where we should put our node, then it is highly likely to get um, uh, an accurate approximation. But this gives us uh, a potential uh, insight to uh, introduce more nodes to our approximation. So what we do, we reduce the degree of the numerator and the denominator by one, and we introduce more nodes. So now we have six nodes. We need theta one, theta two, and theta three to be located at different places because if we um, fix theta one and theta two at the same place, so we can add this third and fourth terms together. So we'll, we will end up with just one coefficient, but we need nine parameters in total just to um, compare the cases. Uh, that I was talking about before. So we need theta one, two, and three to be uh, located at different places, and theta four, five, and six to be located at different places. But theta theta one may be equal to theta four or theta five. That doesn't really matter. We only need nine parameters. So for the first case, we have three different knots. So theta one and theta four is located at minus one point minus point five. And theta two and theta five is at zero, and theta three and theta six at 0.5. So if you look at the approximation, the approximation consists of very rigid pieces of function, and we only get four alternating points, and the maximum deviation is somewhere around 0 0.25. And even if we introduce more nodes, so all six nodes are at uh, different locations, they are all distinct we only get three alternating points and the maximum deviation is even much higher than before. It is even more than 0 0.3. So if we are using generalized rational approximation, then we have to be very careful about the basis functions that we are using. And if we are using um, a piecewise polynomial, then we should know where we uh, put our nodes. If you blindly move your nodes around, it is not very clear what type of approximations that we'll get. Okay, so to summarize everything, uh, when we have a ratio of two polynomials, then the, uh, 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 the objective function forms a strictly quasi-convex function. And if our ratio consists of linear functions, then problem defines a quasi-convex function. And the linear inequality method is identical to the bisection method applied for this generalized uniform rational approximation problem. And the feasibility problem is not even convex, but linear. So, so uh, this observation leads us to extend the linear inequality method to a broader class of function. So we can extend it to, a, it to approximations in the form of a general uh, quasi-linear function. 
So that is it for today. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much, Vinesha. A lot of pictures. Uh, so are there any questions? Sure, I have a question. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, what are what are your ideas for combining the optimization of the knots and the the coefficients? Is the idea so far maybe just optimize one and optimize the other, or do you guys have any thoughts for like how to combine all of them into one big giant terrible problem? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think usually what people do is those block coordinate wise uh, uh, approximations when it comes to uh, uh, piecewise polynomials. So we usually either fix not and optimize the coefficients or optimize, uh, fix the coefficients or optimize the not. So I have no idea if we can combine both together. It will probably make our uh, approximation e uh, problem even much harder. Yeah, I think it will be a very, very hard problem. I totally agree with Vinesha. Um, but Scott, if you are interested in this type of problem, so you have a right method to solve them, then we definitely would like you to um, contact us or we will contact you anyway. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. So more I, questions? Uh, I have a quick question. Um, when you... Uh, do your bisection method, um, you have constraints for every t in that interval, right? Yes. Yes. Um, how are you handling that computationally? Are you just going to sample some t's from that interval and then have finitely many constraints, or is there something else you do? Uh, we usually discretize our, our uh, domain, so uh, uh, we can change the step size, of course, but if you use a, a very um, how do I say? Uh, you can discretize your uh, domain. That's fine. Uh, it depends on the step size that you are using. So uh, we usually use 0 0.01, and we usually take the uh, domain minus 1 to plus 1. It really depends. OK. OK. Yeah, I just want to clarify that point. Thanks. Yeah, so if it's not uh, a finite grid, uh, then uh, it's uh, a semi-infinite programming problem which we have to solve instead of linear programming problem. Is and it possible to solve that semi-infinite program uh, or for some types of functions? Okay, uh, it's probably possible, uh, but uh, it's much harder, let's say. Okay, thanks. All right, so... Uh, any more questions? Okay, so thank you, Vinesha. 